you of life. the desert, a place of desolation, an arid wasteland. Throughout history, the desert has often been synonymous with barren wilderness. But that's not always true. Look closely at this place we have traditionally dismissed as sterile and worthless and find wonders. The three hottest deserts of North America are much more than they seem. These deserts, the Sonora, the Mojave, and the Chihuahua, are evolving stories of contradiction, of deprivation and abundance, high drama, and hidden secrets. The land we call desert was originally covered by inland seas the birth of the Rocky Mountains 20 million years ago brought an end to that. When moisture-laden air from the ocean began to be forced up and over the young mountain ranges, the water was extracted, the air heated and accelerated, creating hot winds that dried out the land. Thus, the deserts were created and are maintained to this day by the mountain walls that surround them. But what precisely are deserts? Bryce Canyon, Utah. It looks like desert, feels like desert, has always been called desert. But climatologists now consider that deserts are not simply areas that lack rainfall. They're actually defined by the water available and by the vegetation covering them. The forests above Bryce Canyon prove that the area as a whole receives enough rainfall. But the canyon itself is a miniature desert because the steep, hardened slopes fail to hold vegetation that could retain the moisture passing down. Without vegetation to shield the slopes, the rain hits them and flows away. Erosion. Sun and wind evaporate what little moisture remains, leaving behind a desert landscape of ruins, a fantasia of naturally formed cathedrals, castles, and stone figures which rival any of the works of humankind. A true desert, the Mojave of California and Nevada, extends over various elevations. The lower the altitude, the hotter and drier the air becomes. Lowest of the low is Death Valley. At 86 meters below sea level, it is one of the hottest, driest places on Earth. Relatively few species are able to eke out an existence in this land where rain may not fall for over two years. Yet looking closely, we find a surprising abundance. In some areas of the Mojave Desert, sand dunes as big as mountains are all that remain from the extinct water bodies and beaches that spawned them. Each dune is randomly placed, but a wave-like symmetry emerges. 
in a never-ending cycle, the dunes are shaped and directed by prevailing winds. And in turn, the dunes themselves steer random gusts blowing between them into patterns reflected by the dunes. The whole system travels continually, even though each dune can retain its shape for thousands of years. Dunes are seemingly bone dry, the lifeless skeletal remains of once productive beaches. At their crests, this is certainly true, but below the crests, the sand has soaked up rather than turned away the meager rainfall. Here, lower may be hotter, but not drier. Dune plants and animals can be limited more by lack of cover and the sand's heat and instability than by the absence of water. To survive, species must adapt. Some insects have stilt-like legs to hold their bodies off the hot sand. The peculiar motion of the sidewinder helps it to grip and pull itself forward. The horned lizard escapes the problem of mobility by choosing only a few square meters as its lifelong residence. It stays in camouflage, burrowing when the heat becomes unbearable. Enter one of the great sand dune artists, the western shovel-nosed snake. What better way to escape the problems of heat and lack of cover than to turn the troublesome sand to advantage and swim through it at night. No desert story is complete without an oasis. The Mojave Desert has a few oases that match our most traditional conception of what an oasis should look like. A trickle of water comes up from an underground stream and abruptly, in the midst of arid sands, the desert springs to life. Palm trees, lush greens, beautiful flowers, and delicate creatures. There are other kinds of oases. The Chihuahua Desert extends down through the American state of New Mexico into the country of Mexico. Running through it, the Rio Grande River is a long, narrow oasis, a ribbon of life in the center of the arid Chihuahua. It draws hordes of northern birds such as snow geese, ducks, and sandhill cranes that need a winter respite from the Canadian wilds where they breed. The Rio Grande Valley, an amazing contradiction. Lower means hotter, but because of the water, here life occurs in abundance in the midst of winter and leaves again with spring greening. A complete reversal of the usual desert plant and animal strategy of avoiding winter and reappearing with spring or summer rains. Disease control is crucial where animals crowd together. Coyotes perform that function particularly well by preying upon the weak and sick. In this way, both the flocks and their predators thrive.
The oasis also attracts resident desert animals. Then there are the rest of the oasis species. Competition can be fierce for the limited resources of the oasis. And humankind holds the upper hand. But here at Bosque de la Pache, an arrangement has been worked out with local farmers. Only two thirds of the fields are harvested. The rest remains for the wildlife. When the feathered migrants leave, the land will replenish for the next Canadian winter onslaught. The Sonoran Desert of Western Mexico and the state of Arizona is the home of some of the strangest, most fantastic plants in the world. Cacti are unique to the New World, but not unique to deserts, occurring even in the Florida Everglades and in South American jungles. But only in the Sonoran Desert do they occur in such huge and odd sizes, shapes, and numbers. Cacti such as the giant saguaro are armed water tanks engaged in constant warfare. They grab water during storms before it rushes away along the surface. Then they hold it in expandable accordion-like pleats against the sun and wind and protect themselves with spines from all creatures that might plunder their treasure. Some, such as the Harris's hawk, use the armed fortresses to protect their eggs and nestlings from the heat and predators of the ground. The cactus wren is even more skillful, weaving the terrible barbed spines of the choya cactus into an untouchable house. Wood rats often put choya spines around their homes. But a shelter with insufficient choya protection can become a death trap. Then there are the woodpeckers, feathered engineers that manufacture homes inside the cacti. Living inside is a good way to keep safe and cool in the heat yet warm during the cold desert nights. Such dwelling places are greatly prized, and many creatures live in hand-me-down homes left behind by the woodpeckers. Sonoran cacti flower at set times, whether the rains arrive or not. Most begin flowering in the spring. This means that a huge, reliable food resource becomes available at the same time each year, allowing mobile species to escape the dry desert winter and return in the spring as the flowers open. And it's not just birds that migrate to take advantage of this opportunity. Bats come by the millions for the nectar, or for the insects that feed on the nectar. Most flowering species are open at night, and many cater to the bats with huge, succulent flowers. A large segment of the residents come to life during the desert nights when the moisture-sapping sun is gone. For them, night is day, 
and day is night as many seemingly abandoned holes come to life. A multitude of small species appears. Like the kangaroo rat, many metabolize all their water from the food they eat. Predators like the rattler and the tarantula are out too. Many residents are also active during dawn and dusk periods. Among them are shade lovers like the desert cottontail and the kit fox. Their big ears, long legs, and thin bodies help dissipate heat. The leopard lizard basks in the morning sun after the cold night. While the morning remains cool, shade lovers are active in the sunlight. There's a second group of animals active in the dawn and dusk periods, the burrowers. The desert tortoise is a classic example of species which escape hot days and cold nights by retreating to burrows. The Gila monster is another classic burrower and one of only two venomous lizards on earth. It's a truly fearsome beast. Then, as morning advances, both shade dwellers and burrowers take shelter from the sun. The desert swelters in silence. No predators prowl, no herbivores compete. A great window of opportunity to feed and roam safely, if one can handle the heat. One of the very few creatures that can is the white-tailed antelope squirrel. Adapted to withstand very high temperatures, they hold their tails like portable umbrellas and retreat to their burrows every few minutes to cool off. Then back up they come to feed again. Unlike any other North American desert, parts of the Sonora continue right down to the ocean. The moisture barrier is formed not by mountains in this case, but by the Sonora's bone-dry winds. The Chihuahua Desert has already sucked them dry. These winds blow the little moisture evaporating from the cold ocean back out to sea, leading to the spectacle of water birds making themselves comfortable on cacti overlooking the narrow strip of life where desert meets ocean. Spring arrives at the Mojave. Insufficient rain has fallen to complete greenup. As always, the mountains took most of the moisture. Plants in the washes through which mountain runoff has passed are greener than the rest. Even those located in the shallowest washes have a significant water advantage. Joshua trees are found at higher elevations of the Mojave. They look like evergreens, but are actually not trees at all. They're giant yucca plants, members of the lily family. The wait for sufficient rainfall has been long and arduous. Now a succession of thunderstorms passes through. 
dispersed at the higher elevations, which receive more rainfall, then across the lower elevations. The pan-fried desert surface is too hardened to absorb much water from the storms. So flash floods like this one can suddenly stream through the dry washes. It's paradoxical that the water so needed here often causes destruction. Across the landscape, the desert springs to life in a frenzied race to beat the heat before the moisture evaporates. Spadefoot toads emerge from their burrows. The eggs are laid in ponds. Within 24 hours, the eggs will hatch. The washes dry out almost immediately. Green vegetation reveals the presence of moisture below the surface from the waters that pass through. Many plants have tiny leaves to help control water loss. The okatea can grow its leaves completely in as little as three days. As the rains continue, a breathtaking miracle begins to take place. Like the spadefoot toads, seeds of annual plants have lain dormant during the dry period. Some have accumulated for as long as 20 years, awaiting a time of unusually abundant rainfall like this. Now, one by one, they burst forth in a rare extravagance of color and form. At last, the great climax. Individual blossoms weave themselves into a brilliant velvet carpet as the desert floor springs to life. Stunning panoramas of endless flowerscapes. For those fortunate enough to witness the rare event, this is the grand finale, the secret treasure of the desert revealed in all its glory. Wildlife returns on Thursday evening at 7.30 when we look at the grizzly bears' home where they roam.